serendipitous that I get to introduce uh, a serious talk about NFTs panel, but prior to doing that, I want to share a little, tiny little teaser that we're creating with this wonderful collective of Bitcoin musicians and artists from all over the world. We are going to be creating uh, something really magical and special that we want to deliver in person to music festivals, conferences all over the world so that we could bring the magic of Satoshi and Orange Pill the world at scale. And we figured music and art is such a really cool way to unite us all and this is what we're going to do. So enjoy. This is uh, when they get these, this up here. You guys ready? And yeah, let's turn it up too when you go. Go for it. Yeah, rock and roll. Turn it up. Yeah, up. Imagine losing your soul to a corrupt system, poisoned by violence, lies, greed, and manipulation. What if you could start over and wipe the slate clean? and do the one thing you always wished you could from the very beginning. To create something pure, innocent, incorruptible, uncensorable, unstoppable, indestructible. What if you could have a second chance to fulfill the destiny you always dreamed of? To reveal a treasure one that will transform fear to courage, lie to truth, hate to love, and slavery to freedom. A treasure that will change the world forever. and roll, right? Isn't that going to be awesome? I'm so excited to do this. So Tomer Strolight and I are leading this and it's going to be epic. So stay tuned and we'd love all your support and input. And if any of you guys know any Bitcoin artists, musicians, writers who think they would like to collaborate, even if you're not a writer or musician or artist, like we need people to, to get this project out there. So every skill and talent is definitely needed. So without further ado, I would really love to present this gorgeous panel. Yummy. I'm so excited. Uh, Lunaticoin is going to be moderating it. So I'm going to let you guys come on up and we're going to have a serious talk about NFT. Yay! Welcome. All right, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Yo. Okay. So, ooh. Maybe that will be better. So we're going to be talking today, we're going to have this panel, uh, a serious talk about NFTs. Uh, I have to say that, uh, I, well, I'm Luna, I'm a Spanish uh, host of a Bitcoin podcast. And uh, I have to say that this is a topic that I was really into when I started, like, oh, yeah, I like this. And, and I have developed my thoughts on this. So I'm really curious to know where are you, uh, where, that you are actively working on uh, with them. And first of all, I would like, well, I'm here covering Vlad that couldn't make it. So um, yeah, I would like, first of all, if you could uh, introduce yourself and uh, explain us what is your relationship with NFTs. Maybe we can start with uh, you, Samson, and then we can come. Sure, I love NFTs. <laughs> so I'm Samson Mo. I'm the CEO of Jan3. Previously, I was at Blockstream. I was the chief strategy officer. I also have a game company called Pixomatic that's building an MMO game called Infinite Fleet. 
So Infinite Fleet is using NFTs in that project, and we can talk about that later. But I also worked with Mr. Adam Saltis here while at Blockstream to launch Raritoshi, which is an NFT platform for artists. And we can go into that too. But that's my two NFT forays. Adam? Yeah, I'm Adam Saltis. I'm an open source software developer, mostly a web developer. I'm the founder of Coinos Wallet. And yeah, I also helped build Raritoshi and the Maven NFT marketplace and a few other ones that I white labeled for a few other clients using the same kind of platform and stack, uh, all building NFTs on the Liquid Network. Patrick? Hi, I'm Patrick Hebert. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Eco Villages, which creates sustainable, freedom-oriented communities, mostly in Latin America here in the, in the tropical regions. Um, and Maven NFT, which Adam helped develop. And uh, with the Maven NFT really is a hard asset NFT sale um, site, marketplace for what focuses mostly on real estate at this point. So that's kind of the part of the company that's talking here today. So, uh, you, you know, no NFTs. There is something going on with this mic. Uh, NFTs uh, have um, some lovers, some haters, some people that doesn't have an opinion, but it's, it's, uh, these are the, the, the few ones that you find. Uh, like most people, or they love them, or they hate them. Um, and yeah, I, I would like to, maybe if you could uh, explain what is uh, for you an, an NFT, and what is your, your serious take about NFTs. Maybe we can start here with uh, Patrick. Well, for us, it's really another vehicle to, to sell our assets, in this case, real estate. Uh, we, like I said, we develop communities around the, around the region, and uh, we were lucky, I guess, because you know, we are the supplier of the, of the homes in these communities. And so the NFTs, I mean, I'm a huge Bitcoin fan, and you know, got introduced to Liquid through these guys, and uh, you know, really thought, um, the, be the benefits of the NFTs, I mean, I have a presentation later this afternoon going basically through the benefits of the NFTs in real estate. But uh, for us, they're, they're great. I mean, there's, there's so many things, the security, the speed, the ease of use, the, 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 the low cost of, of transacting something as serious as a, as a big purchase, like a, like a real property. We're not talking about metaverse properties. We're talking about actual land and your house on it that you live in. So for us, it's, it's a great thing, and it's been, it's been popular, and, and we were the first, Maven NFT was the first company to actually sell home. Uh, the first one was actually in our neighboring country here in Nicaragua, a home uh, as an NFT, and uh, you know, a beautiful beachfront apartment that sold as an NFT, and then we did one in Honduras, and, and are moving on. So it's been great for us. Adam, what's your uh, serious take on NFTs? Yeah, I think NFTs are a useful tool for representing information, ownership of something. Uh, they help you to track the provenance of things. They can be used as tickets. Uh, it could be like, you know, giving a status symbol, like it just shows that uh, you're part of a club or that you gain access to certain events or communities. Um, they can be used to distribute uh, royalties, dividends, you know, to holders of NFTs. Uh, you can repurpose them, so you could sell an NFT as a ticket to an event, but then down the road you might say, okay, everyone who now has that digital receipt, uh, we're going to confer some new special benefits to reward you for coming to our event. We're going to, you know, invite you to some other thing. And yeah, it's just a way of having fun, building communities, playing around with crypto. Um, yeah, that's my take. Samson. Well, an NFT is really just a, a token at the end of the day. So uh, I like to go to the example of Liquid. So Liquid, it's a fork of Bitcoin. But one of the differences amongst a handful is that you can have assets in Liquid. So if you think of Bitcoin, there's one asset type. That's Bitcoin. What Liquid does is it adds another flag for other asset types. So if it's a fungible asset, then it's like you know USDT Tether or LCAT, Canadian dollar stablecoin, and a number of others, or even a game currency. So Infinite Fleet has a game currency called INF. And then for an NFT, it's just a one of one. So instead of issuing a number of a currency, let's say I don't know a billion USDT, 
you would have a one token, like a Adam Salty's NFT token, and that's not fungible. So that, at the base of it, it's just a simple token. Now, NFTs typically get a lot of hate, but at its core, it is just technology. It's inert. It's neither good or bad. Same as shit coins. They're just, you know, a blockchain. It could be decentralized or not, mostly not. But, uh, you know, there's not really good or bad. The bad part comes when it's marketed in a certain way, like Bcash, for example, it's the real Bitcoin. Or Ethereum, it's a world computer, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the packaging and marketing of it, but it's, it's just a piece of tech. And it's what you do with it that matters. So NFTs are the same thing. They are overhyped by, I guess, historically the Ethereum community. NFTs were actually originated on Bitcoin using Counterparty. So that is the genesis of uh, NFTs, actually. It's actually on Bitcoin. So where it gets bad is all these Ethereum projects, they sell rocks for millions of dollars, or they're laundering money through NFTs, or they're overhyping stuff, and they try to establish something like a floor price and make these terminologies that don't really mean much. They give you a sense of safety and they suck in a lot of money and capital into the ecosystem to deliver nothing. So that's a big problem with NFTs, but at the base, it is just a simple token. It's what you do with it that is good or bad. Hal Finney had a great thing in the, the 90s talking about digital collectibles and using cryptography to create NFTs like way back on the Cypherpunk mailing list. I just thought that was cool to shout that out. And, and for us, I mean, it's, they're just a contract. They're a smart contract. I mean, we. Whether you did a handshake deal a century ago, or you know, then you went on to having a sim some kind of sales contract on paper with pen and or a quill or whatever, and then you went into smart, you know, PDFs or or you know, some some other form of document online. To me, it's just for for us, it's just a practical use of it. It's the contract. It's a great contract that is on a blockchain. It's secure and transparent and, and all those things so I don't I, I never understood the hate I mean I'm not crazy about Viking pictures with a lightning bolt through their head either and why they're worth 50 million dollars but sorry not paying shots of Rotosha but the but the you know the concept of an NFT is very powerful so I, I'm not sure why there is that actually that hate like I I guess I learned it from a naive standpoint I didn't have that hate feeling to coming into it and went wow this is a powerful concept we could use it in real estate or any of that. We, we sell pickleball paddles on our, on our marketplace, on our NFT marketplace. Anything that's physical, that's hard asset. We don't do pictures and stuff, but we do hard assets. And to me, it's a contract. Why, why wouldn't you want it on the blockchain? Uh, when they told me if I wanted to, to be in this panel, I, I did some homework. And, uh, and of course, in, during my podcast, I also uh, studied counterparty and, 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 and different projects that uh, were talking about NFTs. And what I realized is that NFTs exist way before Bitcoin. We have been using uh, physic NFTs and also we have been using digital NFTs. Uh, what is a, a plane ticket? What is a concert ticket? At the end, they are tokens that allow you something. They allow you to enter somewhere and so on. And they are non-fungible. They are that one and, and they are, some of them are uh, connected with your name so they are really non-fungible they are a token no so i was wondering like okay they existed but in bitcoin we're talking money so wh why why are we mixing uh, plane ticket uh, plane ticket things with bitcoin no so i i did like a, a, i tried to do a, a taxonomy of 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 uh, nfts no and I, and i realized that doesn't matter if they are the old ones or the new ones uh, they always have in common that there is a, a central issuer and, and there is some kind of trust with this issuer or so, so this issuer, uh, at, at least you have this central point, no? And then uh, I said, okay, why, why Bitcoin, no? Why on Bitcoin? And then I realized oh, what I believe that uh, people uh, that was on the token market and that could be um, gift cards uh, uh, and so on, uh, they, they realized that Bitcoin has two interesting things. Uh, they have distributed storage uh, so there is no centralized server that, to hold your plane ticket. Uh, and also, they, they are fr fr Bitcoin is free to transfer. You don't have to ask your plane company, oh, sorry, I, for, I mistook, uh, I, my name is wrong, I need to change it. And they have to accept it uh, and, and to transfer it, no? to transfer it to somebody else. So um, 
the, the, the question is like, okay, understanding this, I understand why uh, it was interesting for some people to, to think about how to put NFTs uh, in Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but uh, my question now would be, do NFTs need a blockchain? Or could we have NFTs without a blockchain? What's your take on this? Um, I guess, yeah, you can have tokens without a blockchain, like you can have a, a coin or something. But having them on a blockchain gives you all the benefits that you get having money on a blockchain, which is it's you know portable across the globe in an instant digitally and uh, you know cryptographically provable, so it can't be counterfeit. And it has that uh, you know, provable ledger, so you can track through time all the uh, times it's been traded and see what the price history is. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just a lot of benefits that uh, blockchains offer, um, making it decentralized so you're not re relying on just a single company to um, you know, maintain that ledger, like Ticketmaster or something. Uh, so you know that you know, the tokens are, um, yeah, they're, they're going to be around forever and uh, yeah, no counterparty risk. Sounds so cool. So I think what you're trying to get to is uh, would you do it on Liquid or something like uh, RGB or Pair Credit, right? Is that what you're alluding to? Or is it more like a blockchain or a database? Um, it's uh, no. I mean, of course, I'm inspired by the the talks I heard in Lugano about per credit and and how uh, it, it seems that uh, that yeah that we can have tokens and without the constraints of a blockchain. And also, I suppose that you will lose also, for example, uh, transparency that you can have on a blockchain that for some use cases might be interesting. So. So yeah, maybe that's where I'm going, like uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so I would say if it's an NFT, having it on a blockchain is probably better than issuing without because it's not a high velocity asset. Things like um, pair credit would be for allowing you to transact. I would, in my mental model, you would still issue something with a, a chain like Liquid and then you would use pair credit as a transport layer and this would more be for payments. It's like high velocity, a lot of liquidity moving back and forth. But if it's just an NFT, it's more like a certificate of ownership. And you're not going to be transacting that you know, 100 times a day. So you don't need that scalability. You probably will keep it, and it's collectible. right? Um, it's also an important point to delineate, which is NFTs are really collectibles. right? And a lot of Bitcoiners don't, don't collect things other than Bitcoin. But there is a big part of the world that does collect things, digital and non-digital. So I think it's serving that type of marketplace. And there are benefits to um, having an NFT, like Adam was saying. So in Infinite Fleet, the, there's a very clear goal between for us to do an NFT. We're not trying to jump on the bandwagon and say, these are NFTs, buy them. It's uh, about giving a benefit to a gamer or a game player. So the game currency is also on Liquid. The NFT is on Liquid. What that enables is an atomic swap. So historically, in MMO games, people have to have a lot of counterparty risk while trading. They might you know, send money on PayPal first or whatever, and then someone meets you in the game and gives you an item. So what we try to do is eliminate that or minimize it as much as possible. So you construct the transaction, you do an atomic swap on Liquid, so zero counterparty risk. You don't get ripped off. So that was the key goal for us to use Liquid and to have NFTs. And we never marketed it. We say they're NFTs, but we never said buy it because it is an NFT. And I think we sold about half a million dollars worth of spaceships just because people wanted this spaceship. So it's about playing the game and buying it, and you get the benefit of having it as an NFT so you can trade it with less risk. But you're not buying it because it is an NFT. So it's the, the inverse of many other projects out there. Well, and, and that applies to us too in the, in the real estate real world, right? That nobody's going to buy a home because it's an NFT. And if the NFT doesn't have any value to it, then they don't even want it represented as an NFT. But you mentioned the atomic swap. That's huge for us in the, in the real estate side. That eliminated escrow for us. Like, I don't need to have some lawyer out there take your money, hold it, 
uh, we make sure you get the title transferred over because that all happens in one transaction. And the escrow is taken out of it. The lawyer fees are taken out of it. We did a, a, a home sale a while ago, and I think what did we work out to eight cents in costs, like on a yes, six-figure home. Like that's pretty good. Right? So it doesn't get much better than that. I guess you could save seven cents or something. But you know, that it's it, it, it's huge, and then all the other benefits that come with it. So you know, I, I'm going on a limb here, certainly in a in a Bitcoin conference, but I think. NFTs can be the reason why Bitcoin's adopted in countries. Like, I mean, that's what Samson is basically dedicated himself to. And, you know, for instance, transfer taxes. Now, nobody likes to pay taxes, and, and in fact, everybody hates it, but when you buy a property in these countries, and in uh, Salvador here, there's, there's a 3% transfer tax. If you sell a $100,000 property, there's a $3,000 tax to transfer it. Well, the, you mentioned the, the royalties. We use the royalty function in the in the liquid NFTs to you know the real estate agent gets paid the seller obviously gets paid if there are lawyers involved they get paid and it all instantaneously is in their wallet but if the governments are smart the governments are smart they'll get paid instantly too they'll get their transfer tax taken out as a royalty and in these countries down here there are virtually no collections I've lived in these in, in this region for almost 20 years and there, there there's very little property tax collection People, I've bought property here that's been owned for 50 years that has never paid property tax. They wait till, it's culturally normal to wait till you sell the property to pay the tax. Right? It's, we're used to in North America, Europe, wherever, Australia, you know, you just go in like robots every year and you pay your taxes, right? That's not a thing down here. You wait till you get paid for your property. You, you, you get the lien off your property basically by paying your taxes. But imagine all that, not, that revenue not going to the government. How are they building roads? How are they putting in power lines and all those things? So you might not like paying taxes, but in the cases of the countries down here, just putting in NFTs that have, and having a government wallet that gets their 3% in El Salvador's case or 4% in Nicaragua or whatever it is in every other country here is a huge benefit for the countries. And I honestly feel like that was a big driver for us to, you know, we're not as upfront as, as, as Samson and his crew are at Jan3 about doing, but we're, we're trying to also start, you know, small Bitcoin circular areas and, and economies. And I think the NFT is a, is a ticket to actually pushing that. So. How many people own an, an NFT? Oh, quite a lot. How many haters? A couple of haters. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> they also, yeah, there was a little overlap there. Yeah, just kidding. Well, we got 20 minutes to make them not haters. Um, now, okay, uh, we, we can say like, uh, I don't know if it was the first NFT on Bitcoin, but counterparty at least it feel, it seems like to be the, 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 the original attempt of, of having NFTs on Bitcoin. And, and then we got, there is also Omni uh, that has, uh, I think, some capabilities of that. And, and then we, we started to, well, we had the sidechain with uh, Liquid uh, capabilities, uh, capabilities and then RGB, Taro, and I don't know how it's uh, going with Omnivolt, but l let's say that there are different possibilities of uh, thinking about an NFT built on the infrastructure of uh, Bitcoin. Each of them give uh, different capabilities. We just mentioned that, for example, using a blockchain gives you traceability somehow, unless you use um, confidential transactions, I guess, uh, with liquid thinking. But there is others that you can check the supply. I believe this is this way in RGB. Uh, maybe Federico can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you can see how much was issued, but you don't know where are they. No? So you cannot track which accounts have what. Uh, are we going to be seeing now like uh, a specialization of NFTs? Because so far, I believe that NFT world is intoxicated by uh, apes, no, let's say. And, uh, and, but I feel like thinking about this, thinking about plane ticket, thinking about any kind like reward systems and so on, that there will be a specialization of uh, what can they be useful for. And also uh, all these uh, platforms are gonna be useful for a different kind of NFTs. Uh, do you think it's gonna be like this or no on anything? Everything could be built every, anywhere. Yeah, I'm pretty protocol blockchain agnostic. I chose Liquid to build Rare Toshi and these other platforms on because I'm a, a Bitcoin 
lover, and uh, the liquid project was a fork of Bitcoin, so I kind of use it to experiment with uh, new technologies that could one day have an impact on Bitcoin, be like you know, experimenting with segregated witness and other upgrades to the network. So I think that's a good one to support. And it's also uh, with the atomic swaps and the ease of like issuing transactions and following the same UTXO model as Bitcoin, it was just easy for me as someone who's already familiar with Bitcoin Core and the RPC commands and stuff there to just dive into that. So that's why I went with that one. But I'm interested in learning more about Taro and RGB. I just haven't had the time to dig in them, into them too much, so I can't speak to the, the technical merits of all the different ones. Um, yeah, I just think you, you want your NFT to have some uh, staying power. Like, <laughs> you don't want it to just be a fly-by-night blockchain like Solana or something that's just gonna crash and burn and be forgotten to the sands of history. And you also want it to be uh, yeah, not attackable. Obviously, you don't want it to be uh, low enough hashing power or whatever, or some sort of broken uh, alternative proof of something that is not gonna be secure. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not like too fussed about uh, which tech to use, it's more just like having these bearer assets that uh, you don't need to um, yeah, rely on like a single centralized issuer to, to create or to verify. That's just a huge benefit as a financial tool. Samson, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about this. Like, will we see some tokens that will make sense to be on liquid and, and, and some others than not? So that the different properties of uh, each of these infrastructures uh, will be suitable for them or not? Well, I think it doesn't really matter what, which infrastructure you use as long as it's not based on a shitcoin. Because, you know, if you built something big, like, okay, let's go back. So I think. Uh, there were a few companies that did some NFT projects, but they did it on some shitcoin projects, and eventually they had to roll it back because there's some you know, taint there. They don't want to deal with it, right? But that is the biggest risk. If you do a project and you're using Solana, right, because it's the, the great golden child of the day, there's a risk there because it might fail the next day. At least with any of these things, like Liquid, Taro, RGB, there's no tokenization of the gas fees into some currency, right? It's just, you don't have to pay, it's just Bitcoin in Liquid's case, and in other ones, I'm not sure what they are using for minting, for anti-DDoS, but at least there's no shitcoin involved. So that means it's good to build on. Um, the other use cases, I think there are use cases. So if you look at Infinite Fleet, we just say it's a key to your spaceship. We don't say you own the spaceship forever. So again, it goes back to the fraudulent marketing of a lot of these projects. They say, you own this thing forever, but you don't, right? It's a key. If you have the key, you can drive your ship. If you have your real estate and NFT token, then it's your certificate, right? And there are benefits to this because it, you kind of have a bearer type asset and it's easily transportable and verifiable and it makes it easy to trade or safer to trade. So there are these benefits, but I don't think many NFT projects are really exploring that. They're just making interesting artwork and uh, raising tons of money and hoping they're going to create a brand based off of NFTs, right? If you look at a lot of those projects that we dislike, they're really just brands trying to piggyback off of the NFT hype. And unfortunately, I don't think the NFT hype is going to go away because a lot of companies are trying to invest heavily and be relevant. So given that it's not going away, we have to try to make sure that they use the best possible technology, which does not involve shit coinery. So what Adam is doing is very useful, right? There is going to be a demand, so try to meet the demand with something that is good and not dysfunctional. In terms of new use cases, I think uh, ticketing is one that is very pertinent, but not really well fleshed out or explored yet, right? And it goes back to some of the reasoning for Infinite Fleet. It's enabling peer-to-peer -peer trade. If everything is centralized with ticketing, then you have to give personal information. And also when you're trying to trade like secondary market for tickets, you have that same counterparty risk issue. 
you have to pay someone first and then get the ticket. But atomic swaps would fix that. But what's most interesting for me is you should be able to buy a concert ticket or some sort of ticket without giving up personally identifying information. Right? It, it doesn't make sense that you have to tell some central issuer who you are, where you live, give them your credit card information, and then you can enter the venue. Right? So if you could just pay with Bitcoin and get a token, pay with Lightning and get a token, if I don't go to this concert, I'll just give it to you. You have the actual thing. Another thing that I've learned through doing some events in the past is that a lot of these uh, ticket sales platforms have problems at the verification stage when you have thousands of people trying to get to a venue. First of all, the venue, you, you guys probably know, the Wi-Fi is not that stable here, right? So guests that are going there are going to have connectivity issues, but at the same time, the ticket issuers are basically being DDoSed, right? So that adds a lot of complexity, but if you could transfer that token, maybe it's over pair credit or something like that, you're going to bypass a lot of that overhead and friction, and it makes it much simpler. And no one has to give up their personal identifying information. In, in terms of use cases, that's kind of what we're looking for every day, right? On, on our side of the fence, on the, on the more practical side of the fence, um, certificate of authentic, authentic, authentication. Um, those are perfect examples. We, we're talking with a, a watch making company right now that says, okay, I've, you know, I, this is not the brand, but let's just use Rolex. Rolex comes to you and says, okay, we're, we want a, every Rolex we want a certificate for, and it's on, on the blockchain. That, I mean, that one fits in really nice, right? And uh, Adam and I started with uh, the first NFT that we, that we used on the, on the Liquid Maven uh, network our marketplace was um, agroforestry NFTs. Now that sounds kind of weird, but we have a teak and avocado farm in here in Central America, and and we were able to. M most times, if you're trying to get into owning an entire farm, a teak and avocado farm, you know, you, it's a multi multi million dollar purchase because they're big farms. But we were able to carve it down to the equivalent of 200 U.S. dollar to NFTs. And you get, you can buy as many as you want, but you could have as little as one, and you get um, the harvest rights. So this is a harvest right. You mentioned the keys, and that made me think of that. It's like you, you have the harvest rights in your wallet for the earnings from that farm, for that portion of the farm. And if you give, if I give that um, token to a to Adam, now he's got it, right? It's going to go to the wallet that 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 token is in. So whenever we pay out avocados or harvest it or whatever, they, that payment goes out in you know, in mass to everybody in their wallets. So uh, there's, it, it gives people an opportunity to invest in something that they couldn't normally invest in because it, you, know, you don't have $10 million to go buy an avocado and teak farm, but you got $1,000 to buy five NFTs of it. And so I think there's lots of use cases that are new and, and giving people new opportunities to. Uh, <clears throat> I believe uh, you mentioned it a few times about atomic swaps, and I believe this is a very powerful thing that. Uh, that uh, in connection with uh, all these tokens that are not the the, the common ones uh, that you think about when somebody mentions NFTs, but gift cards, no, or ticketing. You were saying, and and I'm I'm really into non KYC Bitcoin, and sometimes in some countries, not Argentina, that there is very easy to buy non KYC Bitcoin, but in some countries like Spain, it's it's getting hard, no, and um, and some I see that some people like try to buy Amazon gift cards and then sell it uh, for Bitcoin, but there is a, it's complex, there are no atomic swaps, no? So I, I can imagine that uh, the, the gift cards, um, if, if you start to, to create tokens of gift cards, or for example McDonald's start to do tokens of Big Mac tokens or something like this, you, you, we will start to see a secondary market, no? And, and I wanted to ask you, like, uh, how important, because I believe we are in the early days of, of this, the, the, the important part of uh, tokens is that they, they, they can speak the same language as, as Bitcoin in the exchanges, that is the, the atomic swap. And, and how important uh, do you think that is this secondary market uh, going to become? Check, check. I got it. Uh, yeah, I think um, that standardization of having like say we do settle on using a single protocol for NFTs at some point, like the market decides this one's good enough and everyone's using it. 
then having all these tokens on the same protocol that they can all be swapped and interchanged, that's like, that standardization is gonna be a huge benefit. And then, uh, yeah, remixing or like repurposing uh, some of these tokens. So like, you might have all these McDonald's points and there's some weird McDonald's collector guy who wants to take them and then uh, he makes like a, a treasure hunt where uh, he distributes them around the world and then you can like earn other tokens if you go and find the McDonald's ones that he's placed around or something like. People ascribe all sorts of value to things and uh, come up with creative uh, ways of like you know, making things interesting and valuable. And uh, yeah, this technology just allows you to um, yeah, just go back to having these digital receipts that uh, prove that you uh, interacted with something in the past and have some claim to it. So there's, there's a big use case there. And I don't think we've, we know all the use cases yet. People are gonna invent new ones all the time. But uh, having the tech to do it is, is awesome. So I think it's interesting to get more things tokenized into Liquid. Um, because then you have a bigger set of assets that you're moving around uh, and you, if you're using confidential transactions, then it's a bigger anonymity set, right? But um, things like you mentioned before, like tokenized Big Mac, we kind of did something like that. So at the Blockstream store, we had um, gift tokens. Uh, we tokenized, uh, we, we issued hat tokens that you can redeem for a hat or a Blockstream um, webcam cover or even a t-shirt. So, you know, if you meet someone at a conference, you can, if they have a Aqua or Green Wallet, I can send them the token and they can go to the store and redeem the item. So things like that are good. I think gift cards are also good, but gift cards are sort of fungible, right? If you're gonna have an Amazon gift card, you might as well just tokenize Amazon dollar points or something like that too. But like Adam was saying, the more things that are added to Liquid, then the better off the entire ecosystem is because then you can swap atomically between all these different types of assets. And <clears throat> I want to ask you, Patrick, because you were saying at the beginning, like somehow, uh, like uh, the NFT is based on 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 hard asset, that real estate, no? And and here is where maybe secondary markets uh, start to to clash with uh, regulation, because it, I, to if I really want a Big Mac and Samsung has a Big Mac token, it's easy to okay, I'll buy it, uh, atomic swap, no trust involved. Then I go to McDonald's and I get it, but uh, like. Swap Swapping properties, uh, this is where um, regulators are not so happy and they want their cut. And so I suppose that these secondary markets are not going to be as bright in, in every field or as easy. Well, I don't want to let all, the, you know, all the, the cat out of the bag in my presentation later, but I can explain. You know, I, I'm talking about how we ended up doing it. A, a, a lot, we watched a lot of people you know, trying to do uh, NFT hard assets, kind of running through a cheese grater, and it's like, we learned from that. Right? And so we, we, we didn't try to change the country's regulations or the world, we tried to change the way we were gonna adapt around it until, until they changed. I mean, I, I think, you know, El Salvador's got the perfect opportunity. They can take um, a property deed or title and just make them all NFTs, right? They can, you know, put them on liquid and, and away you go. Now, now they're, just like you know, they made the hard choice and step to go and do that with Bitcoin, they can do that with NFTs as well. And I'm pretty sure it'll probably happen here first. But we're, you know, we've, we've had to create interesting methods of able to do it in other countries. Um, and like I said, I'll get in, I don't want to waste time here, but I'll get into the details of that later. But I do think there's a, a, there's a big secondary market. In fact, there's a, a good secondary market now because there's so few of these available for people that want to own it like that that for the first guys in, they're, they're able to resell. I mean, we, we do other things too, right? I mean, like I was saying, we do, um, you know, race car experiences. I, it's, to me, that, you know, hard asset doesn't mean like the chair I'm sitting in, it means something on the real world. It's kind of differentiated from metaverse type of stuff, right? So, the, you know, the, anything that's got some real tangible value. So if you want to go ride a Ferrari in Miami and you've got the token for that, you can, you know, and there's only so many times a year that that can be done. Now it's like a Formula One race ticket. You can, you, you know, it's similar to any other ticket, I guess. It adds value. If you're going to a concert and the concert sells out and there's a secondary market for that, immediately the prices are going up. So, 
you know, you're going to get scalpers of NFTs, you know, and, and, and the whole the whole thing. But I, I think there's a huge, you know, secondary market, and that's probably going to help the NFT market expand. Great. We have uh, four minutes late. I, I left. Sorry. So maybe we have uh, some questions that uh, we could be answering. Yeah, there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really happy that you're here in this conference of Bitcoin talking about NFTs. How you can explain or how you can convince, uh, not convince, but tell people about NFTs and this is not the reason or something to hate because we are like a big family in technology family. So we are part of each other. So we should not be like hating each other, but we actually complement each other. So how you can explain this in a fast and easy way so we can work better, better in a better way together? Well, we should hate the NFTs that are on Ethereum and all the other chains, but if there's no shitcoin underlying the NFT, like if it's on RGB, Taro, Liquid, then I think it's fine. It's just a piece of tech, and the goal is to accomplish a certain goal, right? So the question is, is there a goal, or is it just an NFT for the sake of being an NFT? I don't know if you guys agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand the dislike of NFTs. To, com to me, they're like a bare share in a company or something like that. If you own this share, you own that thing, right? And, and, and your contracts, your, your car insurance, your, your cell phone bill, the, all those things are contracts. Like, why shouldn't that be on a blockchain? Like, I, I, I'm, try I'm struggling to understand the dislike for NFTs. And I guess it just comes from the fact that, you know, it, it got outlandish with digital art. And it, it's unfortunate. I mean, no, give them credit for breaking the ice and making NFTs popular. But it's unfortunate that that became the poster child for NFTs because that's NFT concept is extremely powerful, not just for digital Im imagery. Well, sure. For uh, Rarotoshi, it's a useful platform because before that, a lot of artists had to mint on Ethereum and other Ethereum-based platforms, and these are Bitcoin artists. So we needed a home for them where they can participate. They can have the benefits. So the benefits are very clear. You tokenize your artwork. You're not misrepresenting it in any way. You can allow secondary market trading, and you can have a royalty on it too. Though those things are not bad things for artists, right? So you give them the best of that world, but without the shit coinery. Uh, just talk again. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think um, I'm not like super interested in convincing anyone to love NFTs or not. I think, yeah, like it's all a subjective value, and uh, if you don't want to participate in them, that's fine. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be the same thing as 12 years ago when people didn't want to participate in Bitcoin. <laughs> Hi. Question is uh, on like taxonomy. So you, you were mentioning NFTs kind of history and he was kind of calling them smart contracts. And uh, there's like in most people's heads, NFT is digital art. Uh, and I just wonder if, if we should call a different name and just get rid of NFT and call smart contracts and then classify like digital art, real estate, da da da. And if that is helpful. It's kind of a dirty word. <laughs> That's why for Infinite Fleet, at least, we don't really push it and say it's NFT. It's a spaceship. But if you want to understand it, yes, it's technically a token. And we actually abstract away a lot of the complexity. So we don't say you have to get LBTC. We use Liquid Taxi, so you can pay for your transaction fees with normal fiat or whatever you want. But we hide all the complexity. We hide all the NFT stuff. And the idea is that we'll merge it with other digital assets. So it's completely invisible to end user what exactly you're doing. But if you understand it, then it's bare. It's in your wallet that you get when you set up the game. Yeah. But there's a lot of problem with taxonomy. Like uh, even uh, I was talking to other game developers that are building on Bitcoin or building on Liquid, and we're trying to find what kind of uh, word we can use, right? All the shitcoin projects, they have GameFi or Play to Earn and all these things, right? And they've kind of destroyed them. Like We can't use those words, but we want to find a term that can describe a game where you have bare assets or you can get Bitcoin from playing it or some sats from playing it. And we don't have one yet, but we're still thinking. One last question, maybe? Yeah, we have time for one more only. 
Federico. Um, I, I'm working in RGP, so I would like to ask a question. Which kind of feature you would like to see on uh, NFT or in general tokens that maybe we see on other shit coins, but they are not uh, available in the solution that uh, are now on Bitcoin or in general? Like, uh, I mean, stuff like uh, royalties or uh, dynamic NFTs. Uh, is there any feature that uh, you said it is missing now that uh, would be uh, good to have? I've had some people ask about dynamic NFTs and haven't thought about a really good way of doing that on Liquid yet. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, nothing else has really come into mind for something that's lacking. I think it's just uh, we need better UI, better apps, make it easier for people, make things just work smoother. But um, I think at the technical level now, like the, the underlying blockchain level, it's it's working pretty well. And uh, the smart contract capability that we have uh, is is good enough for anything that I've been able to come up with. Okay, thank you.